This is what if. And here's what would happen if the sun exploded tomorrow. That star at the center of our solar system, that super hot ball of plasma that gives us heat and energy, and amazing complexions. Ah, you <laughs> well, it's a ticking time bomb. The sun is four and a half billion years old, but it's only expected to last about another five billion years. After that, the sun will expand, becoming a red giant. Then, it will shrink to become a white dwarf, a dying star cooling for the next several billion years. Of course, we'll all be long gone before any of that happens, but still, can you imagine what it would be like to watch the sun blow up before your very eyes? With a name like supernova, you'd think that a solar explosion would be the most magnificent fireworks show the world has ever seen. But in reality, you likely wouldn't see anything. The sun is 150 million kilometers away from Earth. And it takes eight minutes for light from the sun to reach us. And while that may seem super far away, in supernova terms, we don't stand a chance. For Earth to be completely safe from a supernova, we'd need to be at least 50 to 100 light years away. But the good news is that if the sun were to explode tomorrow, the resulting shockwave wouldn't be strong enough to destroy the whole Earth. Only the side facing the sun would boil away instantly. The lucky other half would experience a rise in temperature that would be 15 times hotter than the sun's current surface temperature and permanent darkness. And without the sun's mass keeping us in orbit, Earth would likely start floating off into space while its remaining inhabitants desperately struggle to stay alive. There is a chance that our planet could lock into orbit around another star that might provide the same light and heat as our sun, but by the time that happened, we'd all be long gone. If we knew in advance the day that the sun would explode, then we could buy ourselves as many as 1,000 years of time, provided we had the resources to sustain ourselves for that long. And we could. Just a few meters below the ground you walk on, the Earth is maintaining a temperature of about 17 degrees. So if we had enough time to prepare, civilization could continue to live by moving underground into a huge network of fortified bunkers. Within a week after the explosion, the surface temperature on Earth would drop to minus 18 degrees. Within a year, temperatures would plummet to about minus 73 degrees. At this point, the oceans would begin to freeze from the top down. Within 1,000 years, Earth's atmosphere would freeze and collapse leaving anything left on the surface exposed to cosmic radiation and meteor impacts. Hopefully, by that point, we'd have found ourselves a new home. The good news is that if the sun were to explode, and it will eventually happen, it wouldn't happen overnight. When the sun does die, it will be a long, slow, arduous process taking place over billions of years. The sun will get hotter and brighter and it will start to expand. During this process, it will lose its outer layers to the cosmos, leading to the creation of other stars and planets, in the same way that the violent burst of the Big Bang created Earth. Who knows? Maybe new life could form. Can you imagine another Earth? A new humanoid species? It's hard to predict how our galaxy might look billions of years from now, and it's especially hard to imagine our solar system without the great golden anchor that keeps us all together. But one day, in the very, very distant future, the sun will expand, and then it will shrink, maybe leaving room for a new star to take its place. Trees are falling, ecosystems are collapsing, and our infrastructure is crumbling. Crops are failing, and water is scarce. Earth is becoming a dead planet. On the plus side, there's never been a better time to buy property. 
But who can think about real estate when they can't leave their own home, let alone get out of bed, let alone breathe? This is What If, and here's what would happen if the Earth was as big as the Sun. Everyone knows the Sun is big. I mean, look at it. And that's just how big it looks from about 150 million kilometers away. Just imagine what it would look like if you were standing next to it. Never mind. The Sun accounts for 98% of the mass of our entire solar system. And compared to the densest planet, which is our very own planet Earth, the Sun is more than a million times more massive. In fact, it would take roughly 1,300,000 planet Earths to fill the entire Sun. But what if it only took one? Earth would be a very different place if it were the same size as the Sun. Just imagine our whole planet's topography being stretched out. Continents would expand, providing much needed relief in places where overpopulation inhibits the quality of life and owning a nice plot of land might actually be more affordable than it is on today's planet Earth. But now we'd also have to consider that every body of water on our planet would have more area to cover. This means that lakes, rivers, and even the oceans would be shallower, making them more susceptible to evaporation and potentially drying out. Marine life would undoubtedly suffer since shallower water would gain more heat from the sun jeopardizing sea creatures that need colder water to survive. With other, smaller water sources beginning to dry up, wildlife on land might have to relocate, or travel much farther for fresh water, which would also put them at risk. Us humans would be in an equally precarious position. Not only would we probably start fighting over the limited fresh water that's available, our food crop yields would also start shrinking. Food crops need a certain amount of soil to grow in and to absorb the nutrients they need. If our world was as big as the sun, then, like the water, our soil would have to be spread out to cover a much larger space. Less soil would mean less food, while the demand for food would stay the same. There's also another issue that we haven't considered, which, when we factor it in, makes life on Earth pretty much impossible. Earth being the same size as the Sun is hard enough to imagine, but when you consider a Sun-sized Earth having the same mass as the Sun, it doesn't only jeopardize our survival, it disrupts our entire solar system. Think about it. With the Earth as big as the Sun, you'd pretty much lose the Moon either way. But if a planet has more mass, it will also have a stronger gravitational pull. In this case, gravity on Earth would be 28 times as strong as it is now. We'll get to how this affects you in a moment, but first, let's look at the bigger picture. The reason why our solar system moves the way it does now is because the Sun's mass is so great, its gravitational pull forces other planets into its orbit. The Sun currently has 98% of the mass in our entire solar system, but now, the Sun and the Earth would each have 49% of the mass in our solar system. Would this result in some sort of binary system in which the Sun and the Earth orbited each other? How would this new rivalry affect the orbits of the other planets in our solar system? And would a significantly higher gravitational pull mean that Earth would get hit by a lot more asteroids? Well, there'd be a lot more to worry about than just asteroids. Our satellites would also probably crash down to Earth, while buildings and bridges would crumble and collapse under the increased gravitational pressure. Only thick trees that were low to the ground would remain standing, but it's unlikely that much else could shoulder the added weight. You would be significantly heavier, and you probably wouldn't be able to walk anywhere. Think about it. If you weigh 50 kilograms on Earth right now, it would feel like you weighed 1,400 kilograms on a sun-sized Earth. The cruel twist is that as gravity increases, time would slow down. So you might be able to live longer, but it would probably be a long life spent lying in bed with aches and pains. Luckily, we can wake up from this nightmare because the Earth will never be as big as the sun. 
In fact, our planet is actually getting smaller. Our atmosphere leaks, and so we end up losing several hundred tons of mass to space every day. So take a nice deep breath and be glad it's that easy. It's not always a good idea to mess with proportions and bigger definitely doesn't always mean better. With the vastness of the universe, everything in it seems so spread out. But some objects are closer than you might realize. Every now and then, a random interstellar asteroid passes through the Oort cloud, the wall of icy debris at the very edge of our solar system. But what if a rogue star unceremoniously rampaged right through the Oort cloud? How bad would it be if it brought other planets along for the ride? This is what if, and here's what would happen if another star entered our solar system. What if I told you that a rogue star has already invaded our sun's territory? A dim red dwarf dubbed Schultz's star crossed the Oort cloud some 70,000 years ago. It passed just 0.8 light years away from the sun, and then it made a turn in the opposite direction without causing much trouble. Right now, another rogue star is moving in our direction. Gliese 710 has about 60% of the mass of our Sun, and it's traveling across the galaxy at 52,000 kilometers per hour. How long do we have before this stellar invader makes its way into the solar system? And what will happen when it does? If another star rampaged through the solar system, the extent of the chaos it would cause would depend on the size of that star and its trajectory. When Schultz's star passed through the Oort cloud, it came five times closer than Proxima Centauri, the closest star to our solar system. Schultz's star didn't have much effect on Earth, although around the same time, early humans almost got wiped out by a massive volcanic eruption. But that was pure coincidence, right? In any case, before Schultz's star turned away minding its own business, it did change the orbits of about 10% of comets and asteroids in the solar system. But what if it was a bigger incoming star, like Gliese 710, that's currently making its way towards us? Gliese 710 isn't scheduled to make its first contact with the solar system for another 1.29 million years. But when it does, it could shake the Earth quite a bit. At first, the rogue star would make its way into the Oort cloud. At this point, it wouldn't affect us directly, but it would send massive chunks of space rock showering the solar system. About 170 meteors, comets, and asteroids would hit the Earth every day. That's 10 times more than what's bombarding our planet right now. Comets and meteors might not seem like a big deal since most of them are small and they often fall in unpopulated regions, but back in 1908 in Siberia, it only took one asteroid to obliterate 80,000 trees and blow out windows 60 kilometers away. If the same asteroid were to hit New York, the entire city would be in the impact zone. All that if just a single star, smaller than the sun, slightly made it just inside our solar system. What would a more massive star do? Well, if a star larger than our sun entered the Oort cloud, it would disrupt the orbital cycle for every planet it passed. Since there are such large distances within the solar system, this disruption would happen over the span of millions of years. It would be an almost slow motion chaos of debris waves. It might even set some planets on a collision course. And that's not the worst it could get. If the rogue star had other planets and moons following it, our solar system would turn into a galactic soup with stars and planets being pulled out of their orbits. Massive collisions would create a rippling effect, disrupting planetary orbits even more. Eventually, the Earth would be knocked out of its orbit too, if it wasn't already destroyed by meteor storms and the remnants of other planets. 
Not to sound too dramatic, but there are estimates that 40,000 stars have entered the Oort cloud at some point in the history of the solar system, but they all came here on just visiting trips. Chances that any of those rogue stars will ever make it past the Oort cloud are close to zero. How much water would you need to extinguish the sun? How would we deliver such an enormous amount of water anyway? And would all that water even make it to the star? Wouldn't it evaporate before reaching the sun's burning flares? Whatever your plan is, be careful, because trying to put out the sun would only make it hotter. This is What If? And here's what would happen if we extinguished the sun. Before we dive into how things would go terribly wrong, let's talk about where we could, hypothetically, find all that water. I've got some ideas. How about the universe's largest ice cube? A gigantic space fire hose? Or an entire water world tossed into the sun? Okay, fine, let's be a little more realistic. No giant ice cube will be passing our solar system anytime soon. That leaves us with one possible scenario. We'd have to sacrifice every single drop of water we have here on Earth. We would drain our oceans and deplete all the fresh water too. Then we'd build a very large fire hose and blast it at light speed towards the sun's core. And then, Wait, did I say there was just one option? I forgot about the possibility of using a water world. Leaving the Earth with no sun and no water seems a bit unreasonable. And we could avoid that ocean draining scenario if we found a way to throw an exoplanet into the sun. But not just any exoplanet. We'd be aiming for a real-life water world. And we just happen to know where to find it. Some 40 light years from Earth, there's a planet primarily made of water with an atmosphere of steam. Scientists named it GJ1214b, but we'll call it the water world. This planet is 2.7 times bigger than the Earth in diameter, and it weighs seven times more than our planet. And it has much less rock and a lot more water than the Earth does. There would probably be enough water on the water world to put out the sun forever, but it wouldn't happen the way you might expect it to. If we were able to crash that water world into the sun, the first problem would be the water freezing in space. Same thing would happen if we could pull out a gigantic fire hose with all of the Earth's water and aim it at our star. The ice would continue shooting towards the sun, but it would face mass evaporation as soon as it hit the star's atmosphere. The water vapor would then break down to its basic ingredients, oxygen and hydrogen. And that's when something interesting would happen. The sun may seem like a huge fireball, but it's not exactly on fire. Inside its blazing core, the pressure is 340 billion times more than it is on Earth's surface. This immense pressure fuses hydrogen atoms together, making helium and giving off energy in the process. Since hydrogen acts like a fuel for our sun, pouring water on it would be like throwing gasoline on a fire. You'd see the sun turn bluish white as it grew six times bigger. It would create an extreme heat wave across our planet, but at least we wouldn't be engulfed by the expanding sun, although there could be other consequences. We wouldn't be able to put out the sun with its own fuel, but if we fired enough water at it at the speed of light, it could break up the sun. The pressure inside it would drop, the hydrogen couldn't fuse together into helium, and that would shut the sun down. But with no sun to give us warmth and light, the Earth would turn into a frozen world. After just one year, Earth's temperature would drop below minus 73 degrees. Most of the plants and animals would be dead long before that. And what about us humans? Well, in the deepest parts of the oceans, geothermal vents could have kept us warm and supplied us with energy. But we just poured all of Earth's water into the sun, dooming ourselves to freeze. 
Lucky for us, the only thing in the universe that can do any substantial harm to the sun is the sun itself. And that would take billions of years to happen. Imagine you were able to shrink the sun to the size of a basketball. At that point, the Earth would be reduced to the size of a sesame seed. That's how massive our star is. But what if this fiery ball of gas and plasma wasn't the biggest thing in our solar system? Would our planet still orbit the sun? Or would the sun rotate around the massive Earth? What would happen to our planetary neighbors? This is what if. And here's what would happen if the sun was smaller than the Earth. It would take the equivalent of 1.3 million Earths to fill up the volume of the sun. It's so big that it makes up over 99% of the mass of our entire solar system. It only looks small from Earth because it's 150 million kilometers away. If, hypothetically, the Sun was smaller than the Earth, the Earth would be uninhabitable. And the Sun? Well, this massive star may no longer be a star. In the universe, size matters, and so does distance. It just so happens that the Earth is close enough to the Sun that it doesn't freeze over like Mars. It's also far enough away that it doesn't get scorched like Venus. We're fortunate to be in the Sun's habitable zone. This means that the size of our planet, the size of the Sun, and the distance between the two of us is what's made it possible for life to evolve here on Earth. What would happen if the Sun was smaller than our planet? A star's mass determines its color and temperature. Bigger stars are hotter and bluer while smaller ones are cooler and redder. The Sun is a white star, not as big as a supergiant, and not as small as a red dwarf star. You might think that by making it smaller in size, it would just turn into a red dwarf with a smaller habitable zone, but that's not the case. By definition, a star, whether it's a supergiant or a red dwarf, is only a star when there's thermonuclear fusion in its core. How small can stars get? Well, we haven't measured too many red dwarfs at this point, but the smallest one we came across has a mass of 10 Earths. That's very close to the theoretically necessary size of a star to sustain that fusion. Anything smaller than 10 Earths wouldn't be a star anymore, but rather a cold and dark stellar remnant. If, for any reason, the Sun shrank smaller than the Earth, this shrunken Sun wouldn't have the mass to create fusion and would burn out completely. Our solar system would lose its only star. Since the Sun is the source of gravity that keeps us all in orbit, all planets, the Earth included, would float away into space in search of another anchor. That's no happy ending for life on Earth. Let's try this again. This time, let's make the Earth bigger than the Sun, while the Sun's size remains the same. Earth's mass would be at least 333,000 times bigger than it is now. A planet that big would generate enough heat and pressure in its core to become a star itself. Of course, there would be no life left on this hot star, but here's a cool thing. Our solar system would have not just one, but two suns. It would become a binary star system, with two stars orbiting around each other, and planets circling them both. In either scenario, life on Earth would have no chance to survive. But life could possibly evolve on other planets, or even the Moon. About a third of all stellar systems we've found so far are binary or multiple ones. Some of them even have stable habitable zones. A black hole is on a collision course with our sun. And there's nothing left for you to do except sit back and watch the destruction of our entire solar system. How exactly would this epic collision unfold? How would this black hole end up in our planetary neighborhood? And what would it be like to witness all this from Earth. This is what if, and here's what would happen if the sun collided with a black hole. A black hole is not much different than any other object that has mass, except it's dense, really dense. All the matter it possesses is compressed to an infinitely small point at its center called a singularity. Most black holes are the remnants of massive stars. And just like the stars they used to be, black holes have a strong gravitational pull. The more matter compressed into its singularity, 
the stronger the gravity. There could be as many as 40 quintillion black holes in the observable universe. Many are located at the centers of their galaxies, like Sagittarius A star, the closest known black hole to us. It resides right in the center of the Milky Way. But black holes could also go rogue. After an extreme event, like a collision between two galaxies, a black hole can break free and start to wander. There could be 12 of these rogue black holes in our galaxy alone, and one could be headed toward the sun right now. If a wandering black hole were headed toward our solar system, it would first reach the Oort cloud. That's the sphere of icy objects surrounding the solar system, two light years away from us. As soon as a black hole came too close, the icy bodies in this region would be ejected from their orbits. You wouldn't be able to see the black hole for yourself until it reached the ice giants, Neptune and Uranus. Looking through a powerful telescope, you could see the gases being pulled away from these planets. All the gases and dust torn from Neptune and Uranus would form a region around the black hole known as an accretion disk. This superheated collection of gas and dust would orbit the black hole, making it visible. As it continued on its destructive path, you'd witness Jupiter and Saturn meet a similar fate. You'd be able to see with your own naked eye these gas giants disappearing from our night sky. Rocky inner planets like Mars, Venus, and Mercury would also be sucked into the black hole and destroyed into nothingness as you watched in horror. Only Earth would be spared. Uh, not really, of course. I just wouldn't want you to miss out on your front row ticket to the destruction of the solar system. As the black hole approached our sun, you might think it would swallow it in one blazing gulp. No, instead, the strong gravitational pull would begin to pull matter from the sun, just like a strand being pulled from a ball of yarn. Huge portions of gas would be ripped away from it and they would spin around the black hole joining the accretion disk formed by the gas and dust of all our neighboring planets. This tearing apart of the sun would keep going until our star no longer existed. What's left behind would be nothing more than a gas cloud. Only the very end of the tail of this cloud might be able to escape the fate of being pulled into the black hole. As the sun's matter was being absorbed, Lethal amounts of ultraviolet and X-ray radiation would be released in fiery explosions. This radiation would be hurled right in your direction, back on Earth. You wouldn't know the ultimate fate of the sun for eight minutes. That's how long the light would take to reach us, but instead of the light source of our solar system disappearing entirely right away, the black hole itself could become extremely bright, possibly trillions of times brighter than the sun. And with the sun swallowed up, the stability of what's left in our solar system would be completely destroyed. An entirely new gravitational balance would need to be established. And in addition to all the lethal radiation raining down on Earth, extreme tidal forces would push and pull at the planet. This would cause massive earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and tsunamis. Eventually, Earth would crack into pieces. Or maybe in the best case scenario, unceremoniously ejected from the solar system. Well, the reality is you and everything on our planet would be pulled right into the accretion disk, along with all the other matter in our solar system. So now you'd have a new front row ticket to the inside of a black hole. 
Billions of years in the future, the sun will begin to die. And this is what our planet would look like. But what if we turn things up a notch or two? Let's upgrade our star from yellow to blue. How different would the world look? Could your body handle the increased heat? Or would all life on Earth die? This is what if. And here's what would happen if the sun was a blue star. Like any visible light, sunlight contains all the colors of the rainbow. But how we see a star or any planet depends on how hot the star is. The coolest stars in the universe have temperatures of about 1750 degrees and emit more red light, while the hottest stars have temperatures over 40,000 degrees and look bluer. Our sun has a surface temperature of 6,000 degrees, so it emits almost equal amounts of blue and red wavelengths. If you could see the sun from space, it would appear whitish. Hang on a second, the sun isn't yellow? Yeah, that's right. The sun only appears yellow to you because of Earth's nitrogen-rich atmosphere. Red light and yellow light have longer wavelengths and can reach your eyes easier. Blue light has a shorter wavelength and scatters more, giving the sky its blue color. But if our sun was a blue star, you'd never get to see a spectacular orange sunset again. Oh, and also you'd get fried instantly. Now, before making our sun blue, let's take a look at a couple of bright blue stars that we know of. On the cooler end of the blue star spectrum is Rigel, the brightest in the Orion constellation. Its surface temperature is about 11,000 degrees. While it's almost twice as hot as our sun, Rigel emits at least 40,000 times more energy. And Rigel's diameter is 79 times larger than our star. If our sun was that large, it would swallow Mercury, and temperatures on Earth would increase immensely. But why stop there? You could turn the dial up even further. If we imagine our sun on the higher end of the blue star spectrum, it could be like Eta Carini. With surface temperatures of 40,000 degrees, this star is over six times hotter than the sun. But what's staggering is that Eta Carini emits one million times more energy than our sun. If our sun was that hot, it would be five million times brighter than it is today. Violent ejections of plasma would scorch our planet regularly. And the sun would drench us in lethal amounts of UV radiation. There's no way you could survive the heat. If you stepped outside for just one second, it would be like stepping in an oven, only hotter. The blue sun would instantly burn all the tissues in your body to ashes and maybe even your bones. It would be game over for you. Just kidding, I wouldn't let you off the hook so easily. Okay, let's imagine that your body was super resistant to this extreme heat. There would still be that enormous amount of UV radiation to deal with. And it would wreak all kinds of havoc on your body causing your skin to wrinkle, age, and get cancer. Your vision would suffer immensely too. You'd get something like a sunburn in your eyes. The UV radiation would make your vision blurry and your eyes would hurt like hell. It would be like snow blindness, except caused by the sun's radiation. In addition to losing your sight, the blue light would mess with your beauty sleep. Blue light suppresses your melatonin levels. With so much more blue light and so much less of this hormone, sleeping would be tough. Poor sleep could lead to high blood pressure, diabetes, and even heart failure. 
the blue light would affect a lot more than just us humans. Outdoor plants would grow smaller, thicker, and have darker leaves. High intensity blue light would promote flowering in long day plants that usually need at least 12 hours of sunshine a day to thrive. All the other plants that don't like as much sunlight would die. Well, you'd still likely have long day garden vegetables like lettuce, spinach, and potatoes. But if our sun became as massive as Eta Carini, you'd have heavier problems than what to eat in your new diet. The sun's new incredibly intense gravitational pull would disrupt the solar system. Yeah, you'd see Earth and all the other planets get swallowed up by it. Instead of getting engulfed by this massive sun, you'd be lucky if Earth went a little sideways and got shot off into space. Then, we'd live on a rogue planet that's not held by a star's gravity and roaming in the universe. But we'd likely freeze up pretty quickly and die anyway. If there's one benefit, it's that all this chaos and destruction wouldn't last forever. Instead, it would end quite quickly. A star like Eta Carini has a live fast, die young lifestyle. At its young age of about 3 million years, it's already nearing the end of its fuel supply. It could explode into a supernova sometime within the next 100,000 years. Our sun is about four and a half billion years old and scientists expect it to keep burning for another seven billion years. So if we turned up the sun's heat, we'd be dooming our star and our planet to premature death. Not that many life forms would survive to see that day. The earliest life on our planet dates back to about 3.7 billion years ago. At that point, our sun was already 800 million years old. Back then, if the sun burned as hot and bright as Eta Carini, it would have exploded as a supernova hundreds of millions of years before there was life anywhere nearby. So our lives seem better with the sun burning at its current temperature. The sun's core is shrinking, but as its core shrinks, the sun itself grows larger and it will continue to grow until one day it engulfs the earth. How long can you survive? What will happen to the oceans? And will other planets be affected? This is what if, and here's what would happen if the sun swallowed the earth. Every 1 billion years, the sun becomes 10% hotter. But here on What If, we're going to take billions of years and condense the action into one month. Get ready, because we're going to be moving really fast this time. Instead of 1 billion years, it would only take four days for the sun to become 10% hotter. This means you'll see the Earth engulfed by the sun in just one month. That is, if you're still around to witness the final event. On day one, you'd be blissfully unaware of the tragedy about to befall Earth. Maybe it's a little hotter, but that's just weather. It happens. But by day four, space agencies across the globe would be sounding the alarm bells. By this time, the sun would be about 10% brighter and hotter. And while 10% doesn't sound like a lot, it will be the beginning of the end for us. As the sun heats up, more and more water from Earth's surface will evaporate into the atmosphere. This will increase the greenhouse gas effect, causing global temperatures to skyrocket. 
all of a sudden it will become very humid and very hot. But the sun's high energy light would bombard the atmosphere, splitting those water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. Earth will begin to lose its water and you won't be able to escape the lethal radiation on Earth's surface. If you want to survive, you'll have to go deep underground. But even under a protective layer of Earth's soil, you won't be safe for long. By day 16, the sun would be almost 40% brighter. Our planet's oceans will boil and there won't be any moisture left in the atmosphere. The beautiful lush earth that you grew up on will become a hot, dry, barren rock. Around day 20, the sun would run out of hydrogen. So instead, it will start to burn helium in its core. The sun is now a red giant star and would expand rapidly while losing its mass. The sun's gravitational pull on Earth would be weakened and our planet would begin to drift away from the expanding sun. But not far enough. According to researchers Klaus Peter Schroeder and Robert C. Smith, the Earth would only have moved about 0.0002 astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the distance between Earth and the Sun. While Earth is moving away from the encroaching Sun, the red giant would grow up to 1.2 astronomical units in radius. The Sun would be larger than Earth's orbit. It would swallow the planet whole. Once it's inside the sun's atmosphere, Earth would collide with particles of gas and spiral inward. And Earth wouldn't be the only casualty of the expanding sun. Mercury and Venus would be vaporized. The rings of Saturn would melt. Pluto would become much warmer. And if there is a liquid surface and a thick atmosphere on this distant dwarf planet, it might even become inhabitable. Unfortunately, 30 days doesn't give the human race enough time to prepare for such a catastrophic event. Welcome to your new landfill, a giant ball of burning gas that we call the sun. With surface temperatures of 5,500 degrees, it could obliterate any type of trash we throw at it from pesky plastics to nuclear waste. And with everything we're launching into space these days, surely it wouldn't be too hard to send a little trash to the sun. But how much would it cost? What dangers would be involved? And why would it be easier to send a rocket right out of our solar system than it would be to get anything to the sun? This is what if. And here's what would happen if we sent our trash into the sun. Our planet is filling up with garbage. Yeah, at the rate we're going, by 2050, we'll be dealing with 12 billion tons of plastic sitting in landfills. That's 35,000 times the weight of the Empire State Building. Sure, it'd be nice to put it all in some giant rockets and blast it off, but there would be some serious risks involved. Like, what would happen if there was an accident while a rocket was in the Earth's atmosphere and all our trash and nuclear waste came raining back down on us? The Sun is about 150 million kilometers away from Earth, so getting any trash there would be extremely expensive. To put it in perspective, the Ariane 5, a modern European rocket, has a payload capacity of 7,000 kilograms and costs approximately $200 million to launch into orbit. So to get all the planet's garbage headed off towards the sun would take 168 million of these rockets just to remove our trash for one year. The price tag would be $33 trillion. And that's just the cost of getting the rockets into orbit around the Earth. 
If we wanted to get them from the Earth's orbit to the Sun, it would require 10 times more fuel. Okay, we get it, it would cost a lot of money, but that's just the beginning of our problems. You see, Earth moves around the Sun at 30 kilometers per second in a direction that's basically always sideways relative to the Sun. If you were to launch a rocket from Earth straight towards the Sun, it wouldn't lose that sideways speed, and so it would miss its target. The only way we'd be able to get that rocket right into the Sun would be if we could cancel out all that sideways motion by slowing down the rocket by 30 kilometers per second. How tricky would that be? Well, put it this way, if we could speed up the rocket by 12 kilometers a second, it would have enough momentum to get out of the solar system. So let's simplify that a bit. To crash into the sun, lose 30 kilometers per second. To get out of our solar system, gain 12 kilometers a second. Getting to the sun takes three times the effort. For the sake of efficiency and fuel costs, it's better to go to the outer solar system, where the rocket's speed would be lower then use a little booster juice to fire the engines enough that the rocket and its load of waste would fall into the sun. Even if we were able to figure all this out and successfully deliver our garbage rocket directly to the sun, it probably wouldn't be worth all the risks involved. What risks, you ask? Well, for starters, let's say we've got our first rocket all loaded up with a bunch of nuclear waste and just as it's about to take off, it explodes on the launch pad. Now we've got some fun nuclear fallout to deal with. But maybe we're a little luckier and the rocket launch itself is successful, but it explodes once it's in orbit. The best case scenario here is that we add a ton of debris to the already growing problem of space junk circling the Earth. The worst case scenario is that our exploding rocket, packed with thousands of tons of household trash and spent nuclear fuel, comes crashing back down on us. Either way, it's not good, and this whole operation really doesn't seem worth it. Maybe, instead of looking for these outlandish solutions, we should just, you know, stop producing so much waste. The sky appears darker. The temperature is starting to drop. Our rivers are freezing. Crops are covered in snow. People could go hungry. Is it just me? Or is the sun dimming? Are we about to enter a solar minimum? Would this help fight global warming? But wait, why are NASA and Elon Musk so happy? This is What If, and here's what would happen if the sun dimmed down. The space rumors are true. We are at the beginning of a solar minimum cycle. And NASA expects it to be one of the weakest in the last 200 years. So what is a solar minimum and what's going to happen when it arrives? To help illuminate, let's explain what a solar cycle is. Every 11 years, give or take, the sun goes through a cycle where the magnetic poles flip. North becomes south, and south becomes north. During this period, the number of sunspots goes from low to high. With fewer sunspots on the sun's surface, solar flares and activity significantly diminish. This is called a solar minimum. And it potentially affects the amount of energy the sun expels and its radiation levels. This could explain why you found yourself bundled up in your winter clothes in the month of June a few years back. The most extreme example of this happening on Earth was the Little Ice Age that took place between the 13th to mid-19th century. Cooling temperatures disrupted the grain harvest and created an agricultural crisis in Europe. <laughs> During this time, temperatures dropped by two degrees. NASA predicts even when we reach the maximum level of this new cycle, it could be 30 to 50% weaker than the previous period. That's leading some scientists to speculate we are entering into another little ice age for the next few decades, minus the woolly mammoths.
Now, the flip side of this solar cycle isn't favorable either. When sunspot occurrences increase, it's called a solar maximum. During this time, the sun emits highly energized particles through space that are potentially dangerous to all electronics and power grids. An extreme solar storm could wipe out power for millions, if not billions, of people on Earth. In a flash, your phone's not working and Netflix is cutting out. The horror. Intense solar winds could also cause GPS and telecommunications satellites to malfunction. Would you even know how to get directions without a disembodied voice telling you which way to turn? Recalculating. Even worse, charged particles could potentially shut down essential life support systems and zap the electrical functions in any spacecraft that's home to astronauts, plummeting them to Earth. But what if the cycle permanently stopped at the next solar minimum? What if we dimmed the sun down? Could this cool the planet enough to reverse global warming? Well, totally understanding the sun is still a work in progress for the scientific community. Ideas about climate change and whether solar cycles might contribute either positively or negatively are plentiful. Unfortunately, according to NASA's global climate change team, the news isn't really that glowing. They theorize that the warming caused by human-induced greenhouse gas emissions is six times greater than the possible decades-long cooling from a prolonged solar minimum. Even if the solar minimum were to last a century, global temperatures would still continue to rise. So, maybe we need to start looking for Earth 2.0 after all. But what does this mean in the short term for our space aspirations? And why is NASA so over the moon happy? Well, right now, NASA is working on the Artemis Lunar Exploration Program. This will put astronauts back on the moon by the year 2024, so think of using the solar cycles as predicting space weather. If you're sending anyone or anything into space, you want the conditions to be as ideal as possible. No surprises. Mm, banana! Good space weather equals low levels of solar activity and radiation. If we can accurately forecast these conditions, even years ahead, we can better predict when the best time to safely send our astronauts into space might be. With this insight, we could also safeguard and prepare humanity for the harmful effects of high solar activity. At the very least, we could secure our vulnerable power grid during this time. Continued research into the relationship we have with our star and the rest of our solar system would be a huge help for us on Earth. Humanity's nuclear arsenal is capable of destroying all life on Earth over and over and over. Maybe it's time we dumped it far away. Now, we might want to inhabit other planets in the future, so how about yeah. our closest star? How many nukes could we throw at the sun? What would be the price tag for this mission? And could we accidentally destroy our only source of daylight? This is what if. And here's what would happen if we nuked the sun. The sun is mainly made of hydrogen and helium. The temperatures and pressures at its center are extremely high. So high that the hydrogen atoms fuse together and become helium. That process releases enormous amounts of energy that powers the sun. It's known as fusion. And you know what else uses fusion to power up? Yeah, that's right. Most modern nuclear weapons get their destructive energy from fusing hydrogen isotopes. This is why they're often called hydrogen bombs or fusion bombs. Around five billion years from now, the sun will run out of hydrogen and die. A dead sun is terrible news for Earth because we will die along with the star. 
Now, if humans managed to stick around for that long, we would be scrambling for ways to keep the sun fueled and running. And if we were also still interested in getting rid of our destructive hydrogen fusion bombs, could we nuke the sun and power it back to life? Well, first things first, we would need to gather each and every single nuke on the planet. This wouldn't be easy since the nine countries that are known to possess nukes are extremely suspicious of each other. But if the other option is the guaranteed death of our only son, eh, they could be willing to give up their weapons of mass destruction for the cause. Take my gun from me. How big is humanity's arsenal, you might ask? Well, at least 13,000 nuclear bombs big, each of them with the explosive power of at least 100 kilotons of dynamite. The United States alone is estimated to have 650 bombs that are 60 times more powerful than the nuclear bomb dropped on Nagasaki during World War II. If you were overseeing this explosive operation, you would need to be extremely careful. After all, you definitely wouldn't want to have a surprise detonation. If every one of these fusion bombs went off, the explosion would lead to so much debris being injected into the atmosphere that it would trigger a nuclear winter. That's because sunlight would be unable to reach the Earth's surface. Cue the worldwide below freezing temperatures, ecosystems collapsing, and nuclear fallout. This accident would devastate all living beings, humans and animals alike. In trying to save the sun, humanity could block itself from all of its warm rays. Ironic, isn't it? So yeah, you'd need to handle with care. You'd also have to sharpen your fundraising skills. If a modern nuke has a mass close to the one dropped on Nagasaki, sending it to space would cost around $170 billion. And that's just for one bomb out of the 13,000. It's fair to say the whole world economy would need to bend and break in order to subsidize the survival of the sun and humanity. Even if you did come up with the cash, there are far hotter challenges ahead. Like, how do you build a spaceship that doesn't melt as it approaches the sun? The closest a spacecraft has come to our star is eight and a half million kilometers. Even at that distance, it still had to endure temperatures of 1,377 degrees Celsius. Only thanks to a thermal shield made up of carbon composite material was it able to withstand the scorching heat. However we send our hydrogen bombs into space, it will have to incorporate a much improved version of this protection system. So add that to the bill. And there would still be a mountain of remaining technical obstacles, like finding the safest location to launch the nukes into space, or developing the technology that will allow us to monitor and control them from such a massive distance. But let's say you managed to do it. All our nukes are in orbit and within launching distance to the sun. This is it. You send the order to fire all the hydrogen bombs into our hydrogen-fueled star. Now you wait to see how it begins to recharge. Just a little longer. A little longer. And nothing seems to happen. The anchor of our solar system continues to die. But how? Well, as colossal as the power of our 13,000 nukes might seem, this punch is nothing compared to what the sun is packing. Right now, our star emits over 70 million times more energy per second than all of our nuclear weapons combined. Even if it were running out of hydrogen to fuse into helium, throwing our hydrogen bombs at it to feed it 
would be like throwing a box of matches into a forest fire. You'd barely make a dent in the blaze. Yeah, that's a bummer, but at least you didn't destroy what little remains of our decaying sun. If that was your intent, you'd need something with a lot more firepower. Meet the antimatter bomb. When the Big Bang created the universe, it did so with an equal amount of matter and antimatter. Matter is what you, the Earth, the Sun, and most things are made of. Antimatter, on the other hand, is composed of subatomic particles with properties opposite to those of normal matter. Put a little simpler, it's the inverse of matter. When a particle of matter collides with an antiparticle of antimatter, they annihilate each other in a flash of energy. If enough of those two camps came in contact with each other, it would lead to a massive explosion, also known as an antimatter bomb. But here's the catch. Antimatter is incredibly rare. If you pulled together all the antimatter on the planet, you'd end up with only around 20 nanograms. A single nanogram is only one billionth of a gram. That is so little that even if it were combined with matter, you wouldn't even have enough energy to boil a cup of tea. Now, you could produce more antimatter, but that would cost you at least $2.7 quadrillion dollars for just one gram. And remember, we're here to save the sun, not destroy it. Don't believe me? Well, you should see where our planet would end up if our star suddenly vanished. Not even the heat from all of those nukes would keep us warm. But that's a story for another What If. This is What If, and here's what would happen if the sun exploded tomorrow. That star at the center of